Welcome to the Rich, Young, and Powerful Podcast. This is the place where we help average givers become everyday philanthropists. I'm your host, Andrew McNair, a financial commentator, author, nine-figure wealth manager, and philanthropist too. I'm going to show you how to give more, how to find more fulfillment, and help you impact the causes that you care about the most. Because when a giver gives more, they receive and become more. And I'm so excited to share with you our special guest for today's show. Uh, it's someone that I've looked up to from afar, and it's someone I've actually modeled m making my company. When I was making my company, I always wanted to prioritize customer service, to be customer-centric. And this is one person that is, I would believe, to call an expert on the topic. And he's really dedicated his life to serving those within his business. And and so uh, he doesn't need a big introduction, but Horst Schultz is the co-founder of the Ritz-Carlton, author of Excellence Wins. And so, Horst, I would like to introduce you to our audience and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. But, Andrew, I'm really confused how I came to the call. You said rich, it's not me, young, not <laughs> mental, but, and, but powerful, forget it. So, so somehow I'm not <laughs> fitting in here, but well, I'm nice to be with you anyway. Yes. You know, it's a great bait and switch. I always love explaining why the show title, it, the show title's got me in trouble. It's probably got me banned from being on some places because they think rich, young, and powerful. And I'm like, no, it's about the rich, young ruler. We can, uh, again, trade our earthly treasure for eternal treasure. <laughs> and uh, I like to think that being on mission keeps us young. So yeah, I think you fit the, the tag just fine. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, speaking about going back to our youth, you know, you and I actually share a very similar backstory that at around the age of 14, we actually both knew what we wanted to do. You wanted to be in the hotel industry. And yeah. I knew that I wanted to teach people about finances and how to give and tithe. So horse, for those who have not heard your story, can you share with us a little bit about your story? Andrew, I'm not impressed that you want to be with 14, be give, uh, giving and so on. Everybody wants, everybody is a socialist when they're 14. Come on. <laughs> but but I, I admire you that you kept it going and why, or they still want to teach and give and I admire you for that. But I, I, want to, I wanted to be uh, in government and give everybody, not knowing that I'm the one that would be the giver if the government gives. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. guess, well, for some reason, I grew up in a small village in, in Germany after the war and uh, uh, with, with uh, very young, 11 or so on, I went to my parents and said I would like to work in a hotel business well, and nobody knows why, uh, because there was no hotel, I'd never been, hotel. I'd never been in a restaurant, I, honestly, but somehow I must have read something and, and, and I they said, yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, and, uh, but I kept on insisting, crying, begging. So my, my parents inquired how to proceed uh, working in hotel business, and they got advice in uh, some agents, government agency, to best work in the best hotel possible and start in, uh, as a busboy or as a dishwasher, whatever, and, and build yourself through a career and, and, and sure enough, they looked around what is the best hotel in the region. We're actually able to get a job as a busboy there, but unfortunately it was a hundred kilometers plus away from home. And at that time that was far, you know, take a train, change sure. three times. And so I left when I was 14 and my parent, my mother took me and I worked in this hotel, living in a dorm room with four other kids in a room and worked as a busboy there. So I, I was um, on my own uh, independent since I'm 14. <laughs> following a dream, following a dream. I was very fortunate though. It could have gone different because I was, I had people, we, we all are, I, I believe the, the result of the input that we have from people throughout our life that impacts who we are and who we end up to be. And Absolutely. I was fortunate, of course, my parents had good influence on me. But when I got there, the first was the general manager who I met, who, who said, literally, you are now here to learn to serve the fine ladies and gentlemen who are our guests. 
You are here to learn how to surf them. The next person I met was the Maitre D, who changed my life with two sentences, by the way. And no kidding. Now, I didn't know it at the time. It went over my head what he said. But, but never in, in the next three and a half years working with him, I learned that's who he is. And that's what he meant. And it impacted me dramatically. In, a, in the first sentence, he said, now, tomorrow, young man, show up here at 7 a.m., if I meant one minute after seven, I would tell you so. He established in one sentence that he means what he's saying. We are precise. We are exact. We, we mean it. Uh, and, and, and we have rules and regulations by which we live. And, uh, but I didn't get it. And uh, the next sentence was, and don't come to work. Come here to create excellence in what you're doing. Now, that really went over my head because I knew what I had to do next. I wash dishes, clean floors, and so on, which I wanted to do. But excellence and washing dishes, I didn't get that. I learned from him, and, and, and he was talking about giving, the greatest giver ever because he, was, he had high intent of teaching us and, be, and helping us young men and young women to be successful in what we're doing and become excellent in what we're doing. He had high intent in everything. And there's probably no more selfish gift than give of yourself with the intent to make others successful. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, and I think it's so important for people to, you know, understand that you weren't born into the hotel industry. Um, <laughs> you didn't even have a hotel in your town and you started <laughs> at the very bottom. I mean, that's talk about stewardship. I mean, you don't go from bus boy to hotelier without, you know, an emphasis on stewardship. Yeah. Well, think about it. I mean, really, I mean, very sincerely, and, 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 and I'm not being arrogant about that. Uh, I left a small village being in elementary school dropout. And uh, about 50 years later, I was voted number one hotelier, maybe ever number one hotelier in the world, and, and, uh, and applauded. If I would think that came from me, I would be the ultimate arrogance that could be. Mm. I'm, I, I know that wasn't me. I know for some reason... Uh, God had me on the swing. You know, when, when I'm, I'm, I grew up Lutheran. When, when for my confirmation, I had to go to uh, a confirmation teaching at the pastor for three years, once a week, before you get confirmed. And uh, after that, the pastor gives you a word for life. He gave me a word out of Psalm 91, Psalm 91, 4, partially. He will take you under his wings. And your confidence, that's, that is written in the Luther translation, that word, and your confidence will be under his pinions. His mm. truth will be your shirm and armor. And that's what it was. And I fully know that for some reason, God was good for, to me. And, and, and don't anybody think I thought I deserved anything of it? <laughs> I know, I know better. I know better. Believe me. I, I know much better. So, but nevertheless, there you are. And so it is a pretty, pretty dramatic from that moment on. But frankly, he put the right people in my way, and including that Maitre D, who did everything in life with, with, with high intent. And I want to elaborate on this because I'm, I know there's someone that has a, a grandchild. They have a child that they want to you know, pass this high intent on to, because how you do anything is how you do everything. And I know that the details matter inside how you ran your businesses, how you ran your hotels. And so how did you, how did you, or how did the maitre d' nurture these high standards and desire for excellence? It's one thing to just, you know, call people out, but to guide them, how does someone do that for a grandchild, a child, or for their own employees? Well, he, the, what, he, what he did very clearly, he was quite rel relentless. Uh, uh, he said, what, when, when you did anything, and you could, particularly when you did something that wasn't exactly right, 
he, he came and said, okay, explain me your intent here. What was mm. your intent? Oh, you just, oh, you had no intent. You just functioned. You just functions. The chairs function. The, the, the ground floor functions. You are a human being. You shouldn't just function. You should have high intent. So he, 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 he really beat it into our brains. And when you're, when you're 14, 15 years old, well, first you resent every bit of it. And then after a while, it just sinks in, you know. It's so important to have, you know, a mentor at that age. I think it's, and, and, a you know, and, you know, Andrew, that's what he meant when he said the first day, don't come to work, come to accomplish excellence, come for a high intent. Don't, don't just, and, and it isn't said that the society, everybody goes to work to fulfill a function. Everybody does things to fulfill functions. And, 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 and the, the, the sadder thing, frankly, today, in my opinion, is that companies hire people to fulfill a function rather than hiring people to be part of accomplishing excellence, a higher intent to asking. And I'm, I'm working with a, with a company right now that does industrial cleaning and uh, I'm consulting with them for a little while now. And when I asked first, how do you hire people? Well, we offered them a cleaning job and this job is said, why do you order offer them a cleaning job? Why don't you offer them to join you in creating a company of excellence? Mm. And incidentally, the function here is cleaning, but it's only incidental. The purpose of being here is much higher purpose. You see, that's the purpose problem. and vision. Purpose and vision is not there. The people just function and, and, and it is a, it's, a, it's really not, we're human beings. We should have have a higher intent in our functioning. The chair in which you're so sitting true. is functioning. You're and, not and I think that that's so important to also, and I'm going to go in a different path is with our Christian walk. You know, we, we can't show up and just, you know, succumb to being an easy believism. I just show up. I'm here to be served when I go to church. Um, I want the temperature just the right way. I want my coffee in the lobby prepared a certain way. And I want the music a certain way. And, oh, yeah. and it's all this consumeristic. <laughs> and so well, it, it can't be like that. Well, in the well, church. Well, stop, stop giving me a bit conscience here. All right, Andrew, please. <laughs> Um, I do want to talk about your testimony and, and share it, it with us. Who, who led you to the Lord? Well, as I said, I, I grew up in Luton. I went to church and, and uh, once in a while when I had a problem, I remembered Psalm 91.4 and I said, well, where are you with your wings? And uh, I treated God as if it was a bellboy called him when I wanted him and uh, dismissed him when I didn't want him anymore, uh, kind of, and then got married. And my wife said, let's find a church. I was, a, I was, in a way, I'm still a against the nomination because they're man-made. And uh, so church, uh, we don't need church. And, but, but we went for church. I, I kind of walked out in a couple of them. And when I, when I moved to Atlanta by myself to start this new company, which turned out we called a little later, it's Carlton. There was no hotel. We had two hotels in construction here. My wife stayed back in Chicago because she was pregnant and wanted to have the baby with, with her doctor. She said, okay, you find a church. You don't like one, find it, look for one. And when I, by the time I come there, I would like to have a church ready. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I went every Sunday to a church and didn't like it and was critical, like you said, the music wasn't right. It didn't say hello, right? They didn't teach right. They, they, they used smoke for some reason that I don't come to, and, and whatever it was. And uh, I didn't like it, and I complained. Until one Sunday I went to a church, I said, wow, this is it. Now I know what a church is. There is a pastor teaching clearly and precise with the book in the hand. That's what I want. And uh, good music. <laughs> People said hello. <laughs> and, well, but... You know, it all plays a role, in, in, and, uh, in, and that's true in our life. And uh, so I called Sherry afterwards, and my, my wonderful wife, and said, I found a church. And she said, wow, what denomination? She said, I don't know. I, oh, let me drive by then later. Let me drive by later and look at the sign, what it is. 
Doesn't matter if they're using the book and reading from the word of God. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But I said to said to her, but you know, there's a guy by the name of, 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 of Stanley or something like that. And, said, and she said, Charles Stanley. And I shivered and I said, goodness, I thought the spirit told us so. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally did. I said, oh my gosh, yes. She said, well, I see him on TV. I didn't, I had no, no idea, no idea. So we went to Charles Stanley's wonderful church for two, three years. Oh, that's great. And, 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 uh, I, and I, there I met the pastor there. I, I followed the altar call one day and made a decision mm. to consciously accept who is Lord of my doings. Amen. So, yeah. So that, that is my, my kind of story. Uh, and, uh, in a way, thank you, Atlanta. Thank you. Charles said, thank you, Lord, to lead me there, you know, and, and, and my, my wife would have insisted. And, and it's funny. And so my, my, my wife, so before we came here, of course, we prayed, should we leave? I had a wonderful job in Chicago with, with hired a wonderful company. And I was a young star there, but, uh, uh, we, we prayed heavy and we came here. And, and after the first two years, I thought it was a, it was a serious mistake. I didn't tell Sherry because she had a baby. We couldn't sell our place in Chicago. We had a new place. We had debt. We had all kinds of problems. I didn't want to burden her more. But uh, after a while, I had to because it was coming to a disaster at my job. So I said, Sherry, I have to tell you something. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, we made a mistake moving here. And she very coolly said, don't argue with God. We prayed on it and we are fine. <laughs> I said, okay, I want to argue with God in front of you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also know that you had a major uh, point in your life d dedicating yeah. your life even yeah, yeah. Cl uh, closer to saying, hey, use my platform, use my influence, and that you'd be speaking uh, even in German about God um, because of a health scare. It, it, it's really – I I wrote it to, to an extent somewhat in a book. I had a – I, I, it was a last minute thought to put that story in there because I wanted to have a, a business book based on stories, but not, and, and which I had to tell my stories, of course, but not personal. And on the end, I thought, since I made it my stories, I would be nearly lying if I don't tell the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. And that was my, my encounter with cancer. Uh, things were going great. In the meantime, uh, Ritz Carlton, we had an name Ritz Carlton. We, we had started to extend and expand into the world. We being where we are being voted best hotel company in the world. We uh, when I went somewhere, people applauded. Everything was fine. When I had a checkup and uh, check out and, and cancer and had an operation, and then I was told that this is a very serious cancer, which always will come up as a snowstorm within ten months or so. So you should get your stuff in order and so on. I didn't accept that and went to the next hospital, went to Dana Farber, and they told me the same thing, but I didn't accept it. So I went to MD Anderson, and they told me the same thing, but I didn't quite accept it. So I went to Mayo Clinic and they told me the same thing. So, uh, but uh, what, what happened there, what, what you referred to was when they, after they determined that, they said, we're going to have to take a scan right away and see if it is already back. They said it comes back as a snowstorm. That was the words. Uh, and let's take a scan. And they took a scan on a Monday afternoon. I was supposed to tell me on Thursday, which is kind of silly. But on Wednesday evening, my wife and I were literally lying on the floor praying. And I had a one and a half a year old there and a five year old and a 10 year old. And, and 10 months, how can I do that? We were actually crying when a friend of mine who happens to be a very even-tempered man, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not even-tempered. And he walks in and said, hi, guys, how are you doing? I said, how the heck do you think I'm doing lying here crying? What do you think? Mm. And he said, well, um, can I tell you a vision that I had before I knew that you had cancer? And Sherry immediately said, if it is not of Jesus, don't tell us. 
And he said, no, it's of Jesus. And he, he told us a story that he woke up at 3.33 in the morning. He said, I don't know why 3.33, but I woke up at 3.33 and I knew there was a presence in the room. It didn't worry me. And that presence said, don't worry about your friend Horst. I have other plans for him. He will speak for me in English and in German to larger groups. Wow. Wow. So you can imagine when you have a moment when you in total panic, looking at your small children, knowing you have 10 months, which every expert tells you, and then this hope comes to you. And you know, and that is what God gives us, hope, in our, through our life. And some people, you know, there, there are two boxes of gifts that are in front of you. One we know has hope and, 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 and beauty potential and everything potential, if I'm not a believer, and the other one is dark and I know has nothing. And yet people select the other one. <laughs> How crazy can that be? I mean, this is intelligent people make the decision that two boxes and I take the one that is disaster. The other one has hope and I'm not going to take that one. <laughs> it's just, it, intelligent people do that. It is, to me, it's unbelievable. But anyway, that was the, that experience, that experience. Uh, to, to round that experience up for a moment, is about three years ago I spoke in in in, uh, in John Hopkins University, and we had dinner. And besides me was the chief oncologist, whom I told that I had cancer. And he said, "What cancer do you have?" And I have to look the name up all the time. Forget the name. He said, "Oh no, you didn't have that cancer. Uh, you wouldn't be sitting here." I said, "Why do you say that?" And he said, I said, "Nobody survived that cancer." It's a very rare cancer. Nobody survived it. I said, wait, wait a minute. I, and I argued. And he said, well, if it's so, so and he said, well, 25 years, the diagnostic was not that well. You probably didn't have it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. Well, and then when I argued, he said, well, where were you operated? Well, in, 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 in Piedmont in, in Atlanta. He said, it's a good hospital. Why don't I ask him if they had the slides and send them to me? I called the CEO who I knew. And he had this, they had the slides and they archived. We sent it to him. He called me two weeks later and said, if you come to Baltimore, I would like to see you. I didn't know anybody survived that cancer. Wow. What a miracle. Now, now you know, you, you, you could think that maybe I say, God took special care of me. I, I don't, I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful. I went in my knee. I know one, two things I did. I refused treatment. Chemo, I refused it. I went on a, on a very special diet and I went on my knees and I had a relationship, found a relationship at that moment when all my egos, everything is gone. When that all, all, is, all is gone, it's much easier to let God in. And there is, and if you talk about Jesus and me and I and Jesus, I know what that means. And, it, and it's sad that for many times it, it does take a health scare. It does take a real illness to put us on our knees, especially when we do have ego, when we're doing well sure. in business. And what's sad is it doesn't have to take some kind of situation like that for us to dedicate our life, dedicate our business, dedicate our platform to the Lord and to use yeah. our wealth and our resources and our time for the yeah. Lord's service. Um, and, and again, sometimes it does take a situation situation like especially when you know like me i'm very stubborn it takes situations like that where we're on our knees to do it so um i know someone probably needed to hear that um when, when i was reading this book which is fantastic if anyone's in business if they know someone in business this is a great gift your book excellence wins um i want to talk about and this is very clear in the bible about partiality and how does radical generosity change our heart towards showing partiality in the church and showing partiality in our daily life? How can giving change the way we treat others? Well, look, look, we all, uh, when, I, when I talk to people about that subject and, given, and, and I know it from my own experience around me, uh, I learned mostly the thing from my wife, frankly, and she was a, I should be the spiritual leader, but she helped me a lot along and to be somewhat a spiritual leader at home. But um, I was not that generous because I was a warrior. 
I was I would have liked to give more, but I was scared. Mm. You see, the, the 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 willingness to give more is once you have believe God that He will take care of you. <laughs> you know. Yeah, we believe in but let me let me make sure myself now here. Okay, let me make sure because I'm 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 in charge and and, and I think that that as as uh, the leader in the home as the 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 earner in the home you have a res- you have the responsibility to make a living and take care of your family very definitely, sure. but you have an equal res- responsibility to 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 trust God and be willing to share also with others. I mean, Absolutely, and and so. It takes in the beginning a very deliberate, and we made it deliberate by sitting down and say, "What are we going to do this year? Let's come now. How are we going to do that? And where, where do we want to? And what is it?" And so, it, it, it takes this the deliberate piece, and, on, and then of course, at the end of the year, you look and say, "What happened?" Because other things came in between, and and sometimes I was still scared. I went too far. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And now, and now, and now the taxes are coming. Now this are coming. And so, yes, I had that. Like every human being, nearly every human being. But I can tell you sincerely. I can tell you sincerely. And I, am, I admire people who don't have that who can do that without. And let me tell you something, because I'm. I could not. I was then worried on the end, and then the following year became an exceptional year. Like yeah, mm-hmm. I'm 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 84. I'm working in the last and and I still had that last year. I mean, when I was 83, and I, and I said, oh my goodness, and I mean, and I I have a commitment. When I leave, my wife is younger, and we have live longer, particularly in her family. That when I leave, that I have to take care of her. It's my, my my big my big worry. My my, my sure. I promised her that when we got married, that I would not leave her without taking care of her. And then so I even had it year and done of course and done this year with eighty four is a banner year for me. After I was worried for a moment that I did we went a little bit too far uh, in our giving. And and, and I had, there there I am at eighty four I have a banner year. Oh, oh wow. I mean you know it blows you away. And so and I, I when we looked at we just looked at next year and I said if Gee, wow, I should have really before 84, 85 developed more trust in God than I have. <laughs> yeah. we, we, made sure, we, made, we made sure we were giving. We made sure we realized that people who needed more. We, need, we have our, our efforts. Uh, and my wife has a wonderful, uh, what is C, whatever that you call it. And she takes care of uh, plan A, she calls it. She takes care of individuals that are immediately in dire street about things, street about mm-hmm. things. For instance, she has this woman who she paid, just paid her rent for one year and because she, and so on. And, and she's fulfilled and I'm, I'm just being part of it. It's, it's a great fulfillment, a great, yeah, yeah, thank you for having the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for having the means to help. Thank you. It, it, it is, it's on the end truly enriching and fulfilling. And that's what we have to know. And I, I, I can tell you that it happened so many times that I said, oh my gosh, when to found the following year was better years. Even now. Absolutely. And, and I, I think when someone steps out on faith, they trust God that the Lord provides, but it changes the heart of the giver towards partiality. You know, some people treat people be- differently, sadly, because of yeah. their skin color, because of their gender, because if they're rich or if they're poor. But when you give towards many causes and you yeah. start to see people as they're all created by God, I know that giving has changed my heart that has connected me to people that I otherwise would never run into because of our different uh, different walks of life. And I think it, it fixes the problem of partiality that James talks about in the book of James. Um, but I also want to switch gears because you're known, your brand of Ritz Carlton that you created about hospitality. And I also believe that when we give, we tend to be more hospitable to others because we know that everything that we have is out of grace and mercy. So I think we're of more of a 
a hospitable heart. And so you tell this great story about St. Benedict and where hospitality originates. And and I would just love to hear, you know, behind the curtain of how you built this culture at Ritz Carlton uh, that's built on this over the top hospitality. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we build them because uh, we had to scale it in five continents around the world, you know, not only in one place. And so it was not just giving it to a lot of employees in one hotel, but giving it to 24,000 employees around the world in different, in different culture. Uh, incidentally, a, a very rewarding thing because uh, I learned and uh, America uh, likes to have these endless race discussions and so on, which I think is kind of a ludicrous in my opinion. It has become a business that's unfortunate. So, But I, I know more about race than all those people that talk about race because I opened hotels with all blacks, all Germans, all Japanese, all, all Chinese and so on. I, I was all over. There's no difference, okay? There's no difference. There's some good ones and some bad ones. No, no, that's as simple as that. And, and, if, you, and if you show them uh, uh, values and they will adopt it, they want to be excellent. So it is not that difficult knowing that they want to be excellent. It's just how to do it. But give them, and, and, and the, the, the biggest thing that you have to do is give people purpose. Just as we need to live with purpose of, the, the ultimate purpose is uh, uh, being, being with God, being with Jesus, wow. But there are many steps on that road to that and the other purposes that we have. And, and even Aristotle said, a, a, purple, a person to be fulfilled need purpose and belonging. But so we didn't hire people to come to work for us. I hired people to join our dream and, and, and work. So I gave them pur- we gave them purpose and we gave them belonging. We communicated ongoing what's going on to come to every employee if they have a, a dishwasher, what they knew, what was happening in the company. We communicated. We told them what they are, what we are. We hired them to join us and not to, to come in and fulfill a function, et cetera, et cetera. And people bought in to a beautiful purpose. Uh, we, we, I let them know what, what I learned. Uh, I wrote an essay when I was 16. Uh, when I worked with that Metro D still, I wrote a, metro, a story around that Metro D uh, uh, for, for hotel school. I once a week went to hotel school. And uh, one day I, I came back from hotel school and I was asked to write an essay. I saw the Metro D approach a table. And I realized the guests on this t- table were proud that he came to them. Now, wait a minute. I had been told by the general manager we are here to be servants to fine ladies and gentlemen. And those fine ladies and gentlemen thought he, the servant, was more important than anybody else in the room. You could tell, I could tell. So that even a contemplated and wrote a story about him. And I named that story, we are ladies and gentlemen. We're not servants. We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Unless we sentence ourselves to be a servant and just do it. Then I'm a servant, but if I am, and I, if the, I define myself in the process of being excellent, and that's what that made it demand. And I realized that night for the first time, uh, it was overwhelming that night, that I am in charge of defining myself in life. Even if I was a dishwasher all my life, I still could define myself as being a fine gentleman. So I wrote that SA, which had done made the motto of our company, we are ladies and gentlemen, servant ladies and gentlemen. And we made it very clear when we hired you, you're not a servant here. You're a lady or a gentleman, but your profession is service. And service means to care about that human being, whoever, whoever our guest is. It's not about us, it's about them. To truly care about and help them to our utmost, to get the, gain the most out of what we make or deliver and create. And we are here for them. And and that is hospitality. Hospitality is welcoming, is caring for them until they move on into the next place of hospitality, which may be their home. 
I, I think there's lessons there for someone that is running a business, someone that is maybe running a church and is the executive oh, yeah. director of church. I mean, <laughs> yeah. these are these are things that people need to hear because that's what people want. I mean, people want to be when they leave their home. I mean, if you can give them another home somewhere else, I mean, they'll stay very long. You see that at Starbucks. Yeah. They needed a third place. Yeah, and, you know, we, we, we did an interesting study. I, I, I overstudied everything, frankly, because I want to deal with fact. And we had a, a, a focus group with a word analyst to analyze what the guest meant when they said they feel at home. And it turned out they didn't feel want to feel, didn't want to feel at home. They want to feel in like in their subconscious, they remember their mother's home. That's how they want to be respected. That means we're here for you, including complaints. When, because when you went to your mother and you had a problem, went to your mom and said, mom, has something terrible happened? What did mom do? You said, come here and hold it, take your arm and come here, my dear. What can I do for you? Mom never said, I called the manager. And uh, so we taught every employee consequently that if they get a complaint to accept that complaint. If you're a bus boy in a, in a cafe and they complain, complain about the TV, you own the TV. We empowered them. I, I, in fact, I empowered every employee up to $2,000 around the world, every employee to move heaven and earth to keep a guest, to put their arms around and say, I'm here for you. Forgive me that my TV didn't work. And, they, and the, by that time, the guest feels embarrassed that he even complained. <laughs> <laughs> and again, what, what's crazy is that's, that's in a secular world, in a secular business, and how much more so it should be as we should look to others that are our neighbors, which is anybody and everybody, and do the same thing in our daily walk with people. Um, I, I would love for you to speak because we have a lot of business owners that listen to this podcast. Can you speak to how you elevated and treated your team? Because you said they're, they're just not another line item with office supplies. They're something more. More than that, sure. Well, as I said, we we, we looked at where uh, I, I never forget walking into the lobby next door. But anyway, and, and uh, one of the, the very fine employee was not there anymore, and I asked, "Where is this this waitress that is so exceptional here all the time?" Oh, we let her go. Whoa, 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 whoa. why? Well, uh, she didn't show up on time. I said that is pretty sad that she made a mistake and we immediately dismissed her. You mean mm -hmm. she didn't earn somehow over the few years the right to make a mistake. We didn't forgive. And it was overwhelming to me. And I, I thought that this cannot happen. This cannot happen. We have to understand that they're human beings. They have to, we have to teach right. And I said, and so I wondered, why didn't she show up? And why would she even if she would have been a bad employee, why? If she was a bad employee, is it her fault? Well, she, she may have been raised wrong by her mother, I don't know, but we didn't have to hire her. We yeah, I mean, the common denomination of every hire you've that you have and every employee you have is you. I mean, you let them in. <laughs> it's us. We hired her, we trained her, we oriented who we are. We create a work environment. And so if they're not, if it's not good, we should look at our process, not at her or him. It's us. <laughs> well, if it's the wrong employees, then my dear friend, you are not doing very well at selecting people. It's you, leader. It's not them. It's you. You are the one that made a mistake selecting. You have the wrong work environment. You have the wrong orientation, the wrong communication. You create a, a wrong environment. It is you. And if you do, if you accept that, then you're able to do something about it. You will not be able to do something about it said they were bad. <laughs> Nothing. No, I mean, I think you're spot on. I think when we start, start asking tougher questions, we, yeah. we can get better answers. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, people are not coming back to church because, you know, the world's just corrupt and the devil's winning. And it's like, no, I mean, that's one way you could blame that. Or you could say, what can we how can we go back to the scripture? How can we go back to the first century church that had exponential growth yeah. and ask, what do we need to change here? And well, I, think I think that's where we'll get better answers. 
I, I bet you in that church, they didn't question the word. They didn't say, oh, I don't like this part. I take this out and correct it. I, I, I bet they didn't that. So with other words, they had something beautiful to be there for. You know, let's say like the European churches, I can tell you why they're empty. It's very simple. It's a very simple reason. They want to be closer to the people. So they adjusted the teaching to the people. And one, once they were with the people, they had not, nothing to offer anymore. <laughs> Come on. No, no, they're still taking pages out of the Bible right now. All around us. Come on. What, what, what do you have to offer? Like, look at that, look at that word, this beautiful offering, this, this hope offering, this beautiful offering. This, I, I, I woke up when I was 80 and, and had a big shock. 80. Wow. My goodness. No. And then in the next moment, I said, wait a minute, not everybody made it to 80. So I should be grateful. And then I looked back at my life and I saw, I couldn't avoid myself. I saw myself looking in when I looked at life. And I can tell you, if I would have been able to change something and live more according to the word, I would have had basically no to single regret. It's great wisdom that, you know, you, wow. you could live 80 years and figure it out yourself, or you could listen to someone that's uh, lived the life to give you that wisdom. And so I always tell people, you know, trial and error is a terrible teacher. I, I do want to talk. Just for fun, Andrew, just for fun uh, conversational, because I mentioned Sherry a couple of times. So let me mention once more. So, so we were in our home in Amelia Island, and I said to her, that was the day I turned 81 now. That next day, I said, I drive to the end of the island on the, and I come back on the bike and come back on the, on the ocean side, on the, on the beach with the bike. Why don't you walk up and we meet the half and we met half high. And I said, Oh, wow, that was much more difficult than I thought. And she said, remember, you're not 80 anymore. <laughs> that would be my That's wife. pretty good. That's pretty good. That'll keep you humble. That's great. Yeah. Um, you, you know, we talk a lot about giving and the antithesis of giving is to be selfish. And so I would love for you to speak to someone um, that isn't quite 80, that doesn't have all that great wisdom that you've accumulated. And maybe if they were to be introspective, they've lived life kind of selfishly. They haven't given towards anything. They've kind of went to church trying to receive something instead of actually giving and serving. I, I just would love for you to, you know, just again, instill one more time. How do you teach the servanthood attitude and mindset that you were able to teach a secular group of thousands of employees? How do we teach a, a Christian? What scripture would you share to recenter their heart on serving instead of being served? Uh, Andrew, I'm, I'm sure you would find many that would do that much better than I would. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, no, very, very, sincere, very sincerely. Uh, I, it is basically a synopsis of what I have said before. Uh, this issue of being fulfilled in life. When I look back and I told you this review that we have every year, and when I look back and it and it worked out, and I, so I, sometimes I was, gee, maybe went too far, but it always felt fulfilled. I did it. There was a mm -hmm. fulfillment and. That what, what is, and that is part of the contentness and fulfillment and happiness of your life. Uh, we, we, there's another uh, social serious mistake as, as a society that we make I mean, in conversation. It's very clear to me that people think pleasure is fulfillment. Pleasure is no happiness, but the fulfillment of having, of, of knowing I did my minimum part of helping another human being, of helping through, and knowing some specific cases because of what my wife does, that is true that you know, if you wouldn't have done it, I would have been really agony and out there in, in some individual cases. So it is fulfillment. It is really, on the end, as I said before, a selfish act. And, and that is really what it is because we have this need. We, if we are human beings, then we have this need that we are only fulfilling for ourselves by sharing and giving 
and trying to do our most, and it feels, and it feels even a little better if it was a little painful. It feels even better. Well, that's why you're qualified to answer that because you just share some great wisdom to everyone that I know needed to hear that. I know I needed to hear that. If if you could write one tweet, uh, Horst, that would be read by everyone. And uh, I mean, in a whole world with so many uh, people that don't believe and don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, what one tweet would you write that if you could know it would be read by everyone, what would you say? Well, I... Uh, I uh... I, I'm sorry, that caught me off guard. Well, uh, I have mentioned several times, uh, excellent is no accident. Mm. It's always the result of high intent and the decision for high intent and hard work. That's it doesn't come by answer. itself. It is, it's hard work. Uh, however, it's a decision for high intent and is in your destiny. Now look at that at one side. Now on the end is your destiny. This world, destiny in this world, that your destiny is not an accident either. It's the decisions that you made in life determine your destiny. So, and if if those decisions were of high intent, of high intent, then clearly your destiny is also high. And so, so, what what does that mean? That means having purpose. High intent, or, or in, the, in the even in the small things that you do, have purpose. Be sure, but if you're a leader, if you're a leader of a large group, be sure that your purpose, that you question yourself, is my purpose good for all concerned? Your purpose cannot be selfishly only for you. It has to be good. Like if you're a leader in a company, it has to be good for the investors, for the employees, for the customer. For society, if the answer is yes, and now you go away and say, would God approve also? I love that. In that moment, you can no, no longer uh, have any compromises in what you're doing because you, you speak for all. That would be a fantastic tweet. Excellence this is not ac- not an accident. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave you with this last question, Horst. Is do you have a, a strong belief that isn't shared by popular culture? <laughs> it's a pretty broad question. You can go oh, in a lot oh, of different ways uh, with that. Andrew, do you have a strong you, you, belief you, you, that you, isn't shared by you, popular you, culture? You you can't you can't open that. That would be opening up a very long conversation and many, many, <laughs> many, many, many things. That's I probably true. You, I can tell you, uh, we have to understand that we have to be careful, particularly today. The culture, the thought of the culture is not necessarily the right thought. Mm. Otherwise, Hitler would have been right. We and and we the the danger that we have, and I see that in our culture here, the millions and millions and millions just follow culture. That means they're not thinking. We we uh, that that's that's a a horribly horribly dangerous thing. We have to be still thinking. When I see, for example, when I see some people, I, I see some cities that are disastrous. Yet they elect the same party over and over and over again. <laughs> I mean, you come on. That's insanity. It's insanity. That means, insanity. That means you weren't thinking. That means you weren't thinking. My, my, well, I think my, it's a culture without high intent. I think what you're seeing is individuals yeah. without high intent. Now you have a mass group called culture that does not have high intent for their it, life. It's no intent at all. It's not, it's not thinking. It's, it's just following, regurgitating things. You have to. We have to understand this is this is this is unbelievable. I have to step back, and think, and think. And, but if you, but it has become if you don't think in accordance with the culture of the place, they're dismissing you. That's the dismissing because you're thinking they're not a culture. The, the belief, the following, and going along with culture and the and the the fashion, the fad of the moment that you're right. Yeah, that's not true at all. That is not necessarily true at all, and it's very, very dangerous. I should keep on thinking and say, what is what is the intent here? What's my high intent? What is really good for all concerned? 
I mean, you know, I mean, so you, I mean, it, I, it, it is it is so amazing. And the, 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 when I see that the, the, the disaster, I lived in one city that was total disaster for, and for 80 years they voted for the same same party again next time and, and think something would change. It's, it's impossible. Exactly. If I do the same thing, I get the same thing. And, and the way to cure that insanity is high intent. And I'm glad that that's the theme of that's it. you know this I show. Intent. I mean, and it's the intent of what you talk about in your book. And there can be high intent with our giving as well. And, and that's what I want to leave oh, our yeah. listeners with is you should think out your giving. You should think out what's the mission statement for our family. What are we going to give towards? What are we going to serve towards? And what are we going to believe in as a family? And yeah. that's only up to the, the leader. Ideally, it should be a joy joint effort with you and your spouse. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's important um, that as a leader in your home, that you have these tough conversations to create high intent. So horse, I can't thank you enough for coming on uh, the show. I know everyone needs to pick up this book. Excellence wins is a perfect gift uh, for someone that you know, that has a business that is in a manager role that wants to be a leader and not just a manager. And it's, this would be the book for them. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, I'm very thankful for the book. It has been adopted by many companies as a guideline. I have one CEO of a, of a, of a scientific company that bought 5,000 of them to give to his wow. employees. Another one, 3,000 so on. And it is truly run in, in organizations as a guideline now. And it's, it's very fulfilling. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Thank you very much, for, Andrew. Nice to be with you. Oh, thank you so much. Well, that's all we got for this episode of the Rich Young and Powerful Podcast. One thing that would really help us out is if you could rate our show and leave a comment on iTunes and Spotify. Also, check out our YouTube channel, The Everyday Philanthropist, to get your questions and answers to those questions for tithing and giving and philanthropy. And also check out my new book, The Giving Crisis, to hear my story from greedy to generous. Until next time, remember that when a giver gives more, they receive and become more. See you next time.